Linda Hall, welcome back to the Rocky Mountain Rider podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. Great to have you on. We're going to mostly talk about your article and some of your reminiscences about our MFW's 40th year, because you wrote a cool article recently about how you really started to get plugged into the world of bringing agents and editors in for the Colorado Gold Conference, which was a really interesting story, and I think a lesson for lots of up and coming writers out there. That's just me. But mm. before we get to that, I want to catch up on all your, well, what your current project um, or projects. I assume you've got always a couple of balls in the air, but um, well, first of all, how are you, Linda? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, good, good to see you and following yeah. your, your book tour and uh, happy with your success on your new book, The Fireballer, which I loved. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, yep. Onward and sideways, I guess, as they say. Oh, and um, I forgot to tell you that my brother-in-law um, texted me and said, this book, The Fireballer, my father's reading, mentions you in the uh, acknowledgments as Mark Stevens, a friend of yours. So my my father-in-law in Maine really enjoyed your book. I mean, not my father-in-law, uh, my brother-in-law's father loved your book. Ah, so that was ah. a recommendation out of nowhere. Wow. Well, you can tell him back. I'll be doing a live interview with a radio station in Bangor, Maine on May 31st, some, somewhere around like two or three o'clock in the afternoon. But I don't know if his signal picks up the Bangor radio station, but I'll anyway. mention it. Well, send me that information later so that I, I will forward it. I okay, will. cool. I will. Anyway, um, well, what's new with you? You've got a new book coming out later this year or early next? January, end of January, called The Royal Game that I co-wrote with Kier Graf. Um, it is actually done in, um, in what's the word? Under the auspices of, in cahoots with um, Alloy Entertainment, um, who they're a sort of an entertainment think tank. They've done a lot of pretty big books and projects like Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants and um, the Vampire Diaries and stuff. And so this was their original germ of an idea, but it is a alternate royal family story where a, um, a character named uh, Jenny Jensen, who's an American um, musician, uh, falls in love with a prince um, whose name is Hugh and uh, ends up in, in the royal family or, or adjacent to and discovers that her long deceased mother-in-law and she have some some dangers in common and she has to figure out what's happened to her uh, mother-in-law in the past to um, ensure that her future and her life is safe and happy with her prince. So it's sort of romancy, but it's also um, has, it, it's more of a thriller than, um, than you might expect. So. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Explain that a little bit. How does Alloy, how did Alloy present this concept? And then how much was it outlined? Was it just a, a, a description of the general idea of the plot? How did, and, and talk a little bit about the artistic process and then also the process in terms of what was their role in the editorial decisions as the book came along? Well, they, they wrote it, uh, we wrote it, they, we wrote it during COVID. So it's different than it would have been. Is my understanding that they come up with ideas and they find writers to write the book. Um, you, then your agent goes and sells the book and then there's a whole agreement that goes along with it. But um, uh, my co-author and I were interested in doing a project like this because we wanted to see how the sausage was made, which is the question that you've just asked. And that is, um, I think under normal circumstances, they have a pretty solid idea of a book. They they have the authors come to New York. You sit down with them with a whiteboard for three or four days and you go home and you write your book. And um, wow. they, you know, you have meetings, you know, um, intermittently to try and make sure that it's going along the path that everyone sort of plans out for it. In our case, because of COVID, we did a number of meetings that were by Zoom or on the phone. And we came up with a pretty extensive outline um, with them. We began to write, we had a hundred pages. Um, typically they sell it when it's done, but at the time, I think the Oprah and interview with Megan and Harry came out and they decided that this was the time to try and sell it. So we sent it out um, on a hundred page submission. And it, 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 long story short, it, it sold to Blackstone Entertainment 
I mean, Blackstone um, Publishing, and it'll come out next year with them. So uh, we had a lot of input, but um, the book got written um, mostly, you know, Kira and I did all the writing and we we knew what we were writing about, but we did a lot of that. Um, we still had a lot of autonomy is, I guess, the way I want to put it. Like yeah. Most, as much autonomy as you can have. They were really great about it. Loved working yeah. with them. Can you talk a little bit of, without going into actual numbers, just percentage wise in terms of Alloy's cut um, with you? You got you and you, Kier, and an agent. Kier and I split everything. It's a confusing, you know what? I'm not the right person to ask because I was just like, I don't even, I, it got so confusing towards the end um, that I. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it, they're owned by Warner Brothers. So, so they're also de- theoretically working to develop it for TV. So it's kind of a cool, um packaging deal for a book yeah. that you're still writing yourself um and not being they're not sitting they're not overlording in any way they were extremely wonderful to work with so yeah what was it like for you diving into the whole royal world were you somebody who paid attention closely or uh, you know marginally before this or uh, marginally I really didn't care um I mean I would sometimes get carried away with some cute outfit I saw someone wearing or a bit of royal gossip but I didn't know anything so I I actually um wrote a lot of the character based prime uh, Kira and I split characters when we write books and I wrote the character based on roughly um on Princess Diana so I did an enormous amount of research because I wanted anyone that was a Diana follower or a royal watcher to know that I knew exactly what I was talking about, even if I wasn't um, following that storyline. I mean, I created my own storyline, but with the awareness of of Diana's story. And I think Kier did some of the same. He didn't do the the amount of research I did. That was my job to kind of research for both of us. Um, And then just okay his what he did with the Jenny Jensen character that's very, very, very loosely based on a Megan-ish type character. Huh. Wow. So, and all these Britishisms and royalisms and language that just has to be so, I mean, we make kind of fun of it from time to time here and there, but it's really got to be it, right? You got to nail it. Yeah, let's without, hope I did. With, with, without overdoing it, I assume. Exactly. Well, but but if you think about any books you've read by British authors or um, that have British characters, you don't have to go overboard in order to, as long as we have the details correct, and a little bit of the language, um, there's so many similarities in British English and American English. It's just, it's colloquialisms and, and that sort of thing. It's more about upper, cl- upper crust, um, you know, upper class, more posh accents relative to non but the books in a lot of the books in the 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 point of view of an American so it works I think yeah yeah I did for that book to come out yeah give us an idea of some of the settings you used um (laughs) well obviously Buckingham Palace which I actually went on a tour of after um after I'd written a couple scenes in there and had the the very surreal experience of a writer of standing exactly where I wrote a scene, not having seen it, and then being there, I, I, I wrote a scene where um, the uh, Diana esque character is walking up the grand staircase um, toward having photographs taken after her wedding, and she has this little interchange with one of the one of the bridesmaids. And I stood right in that spot and <laughs> looked up at what I'd written and looked around at what I'd written. And um, thankfully, the internet can give you a lot of information. It was reasonably accurate, <laughs> so I didn't have to change. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah. Where um, else? Buckingham Palace. Uh, Windsor Castle. Um, let's see. Often the um, often the uh, I'm trying to think which scenes. We did a lot of the, my scenes were um, uh, various spots across, you know, the, there's an airport near, um, uh, uh, God, why, why, my brain's going on me, but I went to a small <laughs> minor airport that's kind of near Eaton, um, 30, 30 miles from uh, where uh, the um, Harry and William went to, went to school. Um, but I did a scene there and at, at Eaton, I did a scene various spots where she would have been haunting back in the eighties, um, where this character would have been. Um, 
Harrods department store, a Harrods like department store. I mean, we, we changed everything. So yeah. um, parts of London that I've been to or haven't been to, and then went to, so I've been to London twice since I wrote the book for one reason or another. And, and I always visit the little spots. And in fact, um, I was just in London about three weeks ago, not related to the book and happened to stay at a hotel that was down the street, just coincidentally in Kensington from the apartment where Diana lived as a single woman. And so um, I could see it from my hotel, which was kind of weird. Um, didn't expect that. I didn't do that on purpose. So, yeah. Yeah. Are you as surprised as I am to find yourself having written a book set in that world? Yes, but you know, <laughs> I've written um, other books set in worlds that I don't participate or um, have any real knowledge of. And I feel like as a writer, it's been a it's a weird conversation these days about can you write about things you don't know? Yeah, culturally, which I agree that you really shouldn't be writing something that you you can't understand the cultural experience of. On the other hand, um, if you delve into it enough and you're a student of it, I don't. You know, I'm not a doctor, but I wrote as a young doctor. I'm not a swinger, and I've written about yeah. the swingers. But I feel like if you can understand and get your head around where you're at, it's it's okay. It's fun. Yeah, yeah. Did the Meghan Markle character bring as much skepticism to the whole family dynamics as as the, the real life Very one different. appears to be doing? Very okay. different. Once again, I want to say that that these are not the same people. They're just mm. roughly equivalent to, as opposed to based on. So yeah. Yeah, she brought some skepticism, but it's more an American sense of wonder. Um, she's not. Um, she. She's. There. There isn't the racial tensions going on that I. I feel like Megan brings a lot of good attention to, and. Um, it's a, it's just a different scenario. Yeah. Yeah. yeah she okay. notes, she notes some things um, there. It's hard to miss. I mean, anyone that would come into that world from somewhere else and that's all of us would have some observations that are kind of, kind of interesting. Yeah. I well, didn't write one last... he did, and he did an, a remarkable job. Well, one last question about this and then we'll get back. We'll go on to the history stuff, but uh you know, in terms of it being a Linda Keir book, which I assume that's how it'll be bylined, right? Does it feel like it fits with the others to you or is it sort of by itself? Uh, it it truly does. We, we write together about um, relationships and, and sometimes those relationships are, are part of a, a thriller setting or a mystery setting or a just, you know, just a a life setting. And, um, we've got the push and pull between a couple and the, and the, the stresses that they deal with as a result of the circumstances surrounding them, which is all of our books and, um, how life impacts life circumstances imp impact relationships. So this book is just as much in our wheelhouse as anything else we've done, which is why we, we chose to do the project, even though it was out of our, um, knowledge, circle to begin with if you if you will yeah well maybe we can get you both back on to talk about it when it closer to publication yeah um all right so let's get back to uh rmfw history yeah. and this article and i think i'm just gonna say i think this is there's been a lot of cool stuff coming out and i thought it was a pretty daunting project in some ways to gather all these perspectives from different people in part because I don't think there's an actual whole lot of actual record about what well, happened. There seems to be <laughs> yeah. much less than I even thought. Yeah. Yeah. But it is sort of coming together and it is an oral history or written history, but your particular role um, really was interesting in terms of how you wound your way into the RMFW world in a very key way. So I'd like if you could just to sort of recap, um, you had an opportunity presented to you and you took it. Well, well let me say this. I, I joined RMFW in 2001 with an idea for a book that I thought was, I was going to go to a critique group and people were going to go, that's cute. Keep your day job. And I didn't have a day job. Um, so I was a, a young mom um, at that time. <laughs> and um, 
so I did have a day job, but it was overwhelming. And yeah. uh, my critique group liked my book and in and and encouraged me to write it. And so I do owe my entire writing career to Rocky Mountain fiction writers. I just want to say that from the outset. But um, in my critique group, my critique group chair was Monica Poole, who at that time was the conference chair for the 2001 conference. And um, she saw me and she was like, fresh meat, you know, yeah. and, and she got me going on agent editor um, workshops. I didn't know what that was, um, but I did it. And it was people sending in their 10 pages and being assigned to an editor or agent to meet with and, and to critique at that conference, um, which we've done forever. And I think is one of the best things we do at the Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers Conference. So and, and your, your role was to coordinate the schedules and the Take schedules all the and the people like the people would send in their 10 pages. I took right. the copies and I put them in envelopes and send them to the other critique members that were assigned to this group. I think I probably yeah. was responsible for, um, you know, people would put like one, two, three, who they wanted to meet with. And I matched everybody and did, I did all the work of, of that. And, and I interfaced a little bit with the agents and editors. And as a young writer, I was like, oh my God, I'm talking to these like glorified people when I was really sort of, oh, I can't wait till I can have a book that I can do a workshop with. I didn't have enough, or maybe I, I, I can't remember whether I had enough or, oh no, I think it was that Monica goes, you can choose who, what agent or editor you want to meet with, you know? And I was like, oh, okay. So um, I, I, it's been so long now. I don't remember, but she's like, you got to get involved because this is how you network. So I did that. And um my book wasn't done. I entered the contest. I think I came in second in my category. I mean, all but then that was the year that the Twin Towers came down um, the day or two before the conference. So the conference happened and I was, I was really blown away at what a good job everyone did considering all the circumstances surrounding it, which were, you know, yeah. no one could get in, the agents and editors couldn't get in, my workshops didn't happen. Nothing happened. And so, but everything happened. And I, and I was really impressed with Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers. So fast forward, um, I, I just kept being involved. I realized right at that moment that if you are involved, you're going to get the opportunity to meet and um, hobnob or whatever the word is with these people who can make or break your career. And that we didn't live in New York and we weren't going to be at cocktail parties with um agents and editors where you can say, oh, I wrote a little something I'd love someone to look at, or I'm a, you know, a young girl in a, in a little black dress in New York. And I've written a novel, not in, you know, that being the, the, at that time, the uh, chiclet books were big. I'm not trying to objectify. Um, and so I realized that I was going to be involved because I, this, I thought of this as a career and I wanted to be a published author. And the best way I could think of to do it was to network the best I could from Colorado, which was at the conference. And so um, I, I got involved. I did that. And then I, I guess I ran for an office and became treasurer for a while, which led to me being president for a while, which led to me being conference chair, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then I ended up hosting the party the night before, which all the agents and editors attended, which led to me eventually being agent editor coordinator. And so for about a dozen years, I invited all the agents and editors to the conference because I was starting to know who was who from paying attention all that time. Um, yeah. yeah and, and, and somewhere in there, you also wrote a column for the newsletter, right? Right. right. That, that, that interviewed agents and editors as well. So I realized that in my, and, and I've been teased about it in the past, I think the word was agent editor slut. And I would like to say that um, I hope that the person who said that was saying it in the, in the nicest possible way, because, yeah. Um, but yeah, you know, my, my goal there was to meet and know as many agents and editors as I could, because, because my ego was really tied up in my writing, in my books. And every time I'd get a rejection, it would kill me. And, you know, that we live, we get tons and tons of rejections and, and, you know, I was happily married at the time. So the word select was, you know, um, not, not literal, um, at all, but, but what I did realize, and I knew from dating is you can think somebody looks good on paper and then you meet them and you have absolutely nothing in common with them. And I felt the same thing. It turned out about writing that someone could say, I'm looking for chiclet 
or whatever it was I was writing at the time, or a mystery or science fiction, but not yours. And that doesn't mean yours is bad. It just means you're not right. That agent, that editor, I learned about the business a whole lot from sitting there listening to them talking. And I learned that my feelings couldn't be as involved, but I had to be able to discern when my writing need to be improved, which is what I was trying to do. So um, that's a really short way of long way of saying that I came up with the idea of interviewing an agent every month for the RMFW newsletter. And to me, that gave me information about agents that I'd been curious about. They almost all said yes. And I did an interview every month and I actually got my first agent through that. Tell that story. How did that, how did that, how did you uh, pursue that? I interviewed an agent named Irene Cross, um, who isn't around anymore as an agent, or I don't know what's happened to her. And she and I had a nice conversation and she kindly said at the end of our conversation, which is something I didn't do, I didn't push my own work ever. This was strictly for RMFW, but she said, what do you write? And I told her what I was working on. And she said, my daughter is, uh, uh, was an editor at Avon or somewhere. And now she's gone off and she's an agent. And um, your book sounds like something she might be interested in. And so I sent my book to her daughter and then she ended up being my first agent. So it did work. And um, I was always surprised that no one no one took over for me or asked me to help me or, or thought that that would be an f- interesting thing to do. And then I was surprised when I stopped doing the agent and editor invitations that no one wanted to pick up where I'd left off because it was such a, such a no brainer to me. Yeah. And probably didn't, I mean, it involved a little work to get the agent or editor to schedule a time for the interview, but that's it writing it up and just what you get out of that, both learning their perspective and what they do, plus establishing a little bit of a relationship. Um, Yeah. Wow. Well, you know, one of my early reminiscences or just memories, reminiscences, too much, too big a word. I don't even know why I said that word. One of my early memories, just coming to uh, the first party at your house. And, you know, I was just... Uh, you know, walking around outside thinking, do I really belong in there? You know, I, I was so nervous about coming in and, uh, um, you know, you talk about the, how they were glorified, some of these people. And I think you're right from the Colorado perspective, we're not hobnobbing in New York. We're not going to these parties. We don't bump into these people and get to know them as human beings, but once in the door of our house and sitting around the backyard, um, we get to know and see them as real people. And that that's over time, of course, what they are. They happen to be real people who just are in a different part of the business. That's right. And um, they know things we don't know too, though. So, you know, on the, on the other hand, they know what's happening in the industry if they're good. Some of them are bad agents and some of them are even worse than bad as as we know. And so I felt like, this this thing I did, which was to get to know them, gave me so much information about about things I could ins and outs of the business that I I never expected. And sitting talking to them um, at co- because they knew me at the conferences, they would invite me to come sit down, or or they would gravitate to me. A lot of them were very introverted and shy. Actually, as it turns out, they're they're bookworms that love to read and got into the business, and. Um, they would sit there and they'd start chatting. They would do start doing shop talk. And I was like, you know, listening to it. And then sometimes absolutely flabbergasted at how much he didn't like somebody or that like someone that I thought would be a perfect, you know, agent for me or editor for me and just being flabbergasted at how um, not right for my work and for who I am, they were as people. Yeah. Necessarily in a bad way, just, this is just a no go. So, I mean, it just changed my whole perspective of the business to get to know them as people. And, yeah. and I'm really thankful for that chance. Honestly. Yeah. Wow. I still am actually when, when the rejections come and they, they still do all the time along with the, you know, I'm, I've had a nice career and, and I've been very, very lucky, but at the same time, the rejections come and they don't hurt the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Which isn't to say they don't hurt. <laughs> they still do. But, um, different my perception of it all is different well 
I have a similar, just, you know, if I were to boil it all down to advice, my advice would be somewhat similar. I, and I put it this way, I can't imagine sitting at home only hoping that a query to the slush pile works. I can't imagine that would be my only strategy. And I can't imagine that, you know, I would put any faith in that other than about a one in a million chance of it paying off because right. you're putting so much emphasis on that one page query letter and maybe the first 10 pages of your work. Whereas the odds of building a relationship with an agent or editor by going to a conference, by hanging out at the bars, by being uh, talkative in the hallways and, 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 or, you know, around the different banquets and programs uh, by involving yourself with Rocky Mountain fiction writers or Rocky Mountain mystery writers or Colorado Authors League or Northern Colorado writers or Pikes Peak writers or whatever, just getting out there and establishing that human contact is where it's at. You know, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I'll never forget. Um, it was my first or second conference. And I talked to this writer. I was just chatting with her. I don't, I, can't even remember her name. And she goes, oh, query my agent. And she gave me her agent's name and information. And I was able to say, such and such gave me your name. And that alone got me read. It, she didn't take my book and she really wasn't the right agent for me um, as it turned out. But gosh, I was so incredibly appreciative. And, and I've tried when I think somebody has something to you know pass them along. And when I was really in the know, which I'm not anymore, um, I would say, try this agent, try this agent, try this agent, try this agent. They all seem like the kind of people that might be interested in what, what you're doing, or they told me they were looking for that or this or that. And I was able to hopefully pay it forward a little bit too in all these years. Yeah. yeah. How do you balance now that you've got a pretty steady fiction writing career? How do you balance that with being involved with RMFW and other organizations? Um, I'm sadly remiss at this point, but the, a lot of it, that has to do with COVID and the post COVID and being busy and doing freelance writing. And, you know, I've built a career where I've been pretty busy. I keep thinking it's time to um, move back into a more involved uh, reality, probably for my own well-being more than anything, because I'm not introverted. Um, and I live an introvert's life these days, but um after Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers, after I kind of did everything I could do at Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers, and, and actually I feel like RMFW has sort of taken a direction that I'm not as helpful for, which is um, there's such an emphasis on the self-publishing and I know nothing. You know, I've done a little bit of self-publishing with books that I've gotten the rights back from. And um, I've done, I'd say a bad job of it, but I wasn't actually looking to do anything other than have them out there for any of my readers that wanted to be able to read my older books. But I, I, I felt like I wasn't as um, able to contribute in the way that I was before. So I moved into to Mystery Writers of America where I served on the national board for a couple of years, loved that, it was great. And I made a whole lot of friends that are um, in the crime fiction community. So I, I go to BoucherCon every year, I do all that. Um, I did sign up this year for the police, the police uh, writers, Academy, the police, it's the last year, I don't remember the exact name, um, in Wisconsin, and I'm really looking forward to going to that. But um, even after I stopped doing the RMFW thing, I, I hosted the parties for another dozen years and continued to invite agents and editors to stay involved. Um, now, now I'm sort of thinking again about what I should be doing, to yeah. be honest. Yeah. I wonder if the pendulum will swing a little bit and if, or, or if it'll take some involvement from folks like you and others, maybe we can re-strengthen the quote unquote traditional side of RMFW. Um, not that there's anything wrong with self-publishing, independent publishing, whatever you call, call it. Of course, there's nothing wrong with it. It's great. It gets your voices out there in the world, but RMFW built itself by helping unpublished writers reach publication through traditional means back in the 90s and early 2000s when independent publishing was not as in favor it was seen as a vanity thing and right, uh, right. um so i just I, I think rmfw is as good as its membership and maybe we need to do something to kind of help strengthen that part that 
aspect of its of its organization. It's not a bad idea. I, I think publishing has gotten really challenging. Um, we're down to so few um, traditional publishers, and and the strike zone has changed a lot. Um, I appreciate the baseball metaphor. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, so it, it is it's an interesting question and an interesting challenge. I'm always up for an interesting question and an interesting yeah. <laughs> And I love RMFW, so, you know. Yeah. Always. Well, I mean, it, it, things are shrinking, but every time you turn around, somebody's got five more books or, you know, you're, you can't right. keep up with everything that's being published, so. It's, well, and my newest publisher, Blackstone, is really dynamic and interesting and doing cool stuff. So new new publishers show up. Yeah. You know, and they're they're I think the biggest in what's considered to be an independent publisher, but I don't know what makes one or the other at this point. Right. And and they're known for audio is what they came out of, but now they're across the board, obviously. Well, and audio was a cool new. <laughs> new way of doing books. I mean, they were around forever, but, but, you know, it's become quite the, the way people listen to books. So, yeah. 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 So as you look back, um, Linda, just thinking back on those early sort of decisions, I don't know if they were conscious decisions or just something in your personality that said, this seems like a door is opening. I better walk through it. And, you know, those early days of organizing the critiques at the conference, you must be glad you answered the quote unquote call. Yeah, my entire publishing career is due to to being involved at Rocky Mountain Fiction Writers because I did that. And then as I was um, organizing that agent and editor critique thing, which I think I did for a couple of years, I invited two editors to conference, one of whom was named is named Ben Leroy. Um, he was with uh, Tyrus Books at the time because because um, I I had called the lady who runs Poison Pen, Barbara, and she said I she said no, and she said try this guy. He became one of my closest friends to this day, and published my first book. And at the same time, I in, I invited um, Terry Bischoff, um, who was with Midnight Inc. Because when I was inviting people for conference, um, I tried to make sure that I got agents and editors from across the board, all genres and different levels of genres. Like I'm not trying to invite everybody that's like the biggest agent and editor because everybody's at different levels of their career. So I wanted to make sure that no matter who came to the conference, they had at least one agent or editor that they would want to be chatting with, um, whether they were a established professional or a first day of writing and um, in whatever genre. And I happened to be chatting. I made, I really connected with Terry. She was, I, I met her because she showed up at my house for the party one night and she walked in and um, we became friends that evening and we were friends ever since. And when I left that weekend, she goes, I really wish you, you wrote mystery. I really wish you did. And I had, I said, yeah, but I don't Oh Well, you know, gave her a big hug goodbye. And then I was like, Oh my God. An editor said, I wish you wrote mystery. And I went to a bookstore, read 40 mysteries like the kind she acquired. And I emailed her back and said, I have an idea for a mystery. And she laughed. And I wrote a um, hundred pages and sent it to her. And I had a three book deal the next day. So yeah, I'm fiction writers and Ben, yep. Ben published my first book. He's, he said to me, I had an agent. He goes, if you don't sell it anywhere else, try and sell it somewhere else. If you don't, I'm buying it. He goes, but I don't want to take it, you know, because he didn't pay very much, but he paid. And so I had two books out after a dozen years of trying to get published. I got, I had two books out in one year. It was pretty cool. And I've been publishing ever since. And yeah. I now have 10 published books. So 10, 10, 10 or 11. Wow. Wow. And uh, just a quick plug for Ben. I mean, in addition to being a great guy, he runs a great podcast called um, Collaboracast out of his outfit, Collaborist. And if people are wanting advice on query letters and writing and agents and the publishing world, it's a great podcast to follow. And it's also on YouTube, highly recommended. And um, also he's heavily involved with Salida Writers Retreat, which happens every year. And if you get into the world of Ben Leroy or Anita Mum, again, contacts, relationships, um, and also terrific advice on the actual words on the page from, from both of those folks. Yeah, they're incredible. And yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I, we I, can talk. I, I feel lucky. I, you know, I just feel blessed to have met him and Terry and everyone I met along the way. Um, it really helped give my career some perspective. And on the days when it's hard, and it still is, um, some days, and some days it's amazing, he, these people keep you, um, keep the perspective where it should yeah. be, you know? That's great. Yep. Excellent. Well, Linda, um, as we wrap up, we always like to give a shout out to a book or, a, yeah, I see the panic look on your face. You must have read something recently that you'd like to recommend or a writer in general who needs a little promotion, something. Um, well, I'm reading Glennon Doyle right now because everyone told me I was supposed to be reading her books. It's sort of woman power. Um, take back your, 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 and, and I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by, by her story. I'm lately have been liking nonfiction more than I like, um, want to read fiction. I'm trying to think what I just finished before then. And I knew you were going to say this and I've been trying to think of the book I finished right before this book. And it was someone, ah, I read, um, I never read any science fiction. I never read any futuristic stuff, but I read, um, okay, what, Blake Crouch recently. Ah. Blake Crouch. Now that's not my thing, but he does, he writes, he's, he's just a really talented sort of science fiction and, um, um, a pot, you know, near and post-apocalyptic writer and all this stuff seems to sell for and, and be made into television shows. So read yourself a little Blake Crouch if you're looking some, for some very good commercial um, science fiction and post-apocalyptic kind of matter. He wrote Dark Matter, yep. the, Dark Matter. That was his famous book. This one I read was was newer than that. Can't think, I can't think of the name, but yeah, two authors for you. Mm-hmm. There you go. Blake, allegedly a neighbor of mine down here in Southwest Colorado, somewhere near Durango, but I've never, never seen him, but I know he does he's here. Live down there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he's anyway. a cool guy. You'll run into him eventually. Yeah, yeah. Linda Hall, thank you so much and uh, good luck. Let's touch base next, uh, early next year when number book number 10 goes out into the world. Hold on, hang on. Three, <laughs> four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Book number ten comes. I'm working on eleven, which I can't tell you about yet. But um, that's why I'm confused. You're working on eleven. You can't tell us. We'll just keep it right here on the podcast. Nobody will know. Yeah. <laughs> Good enough. Thank you, Linda. Thanks, Mark.